Hello, welcome back. This is Jonathan Gardner. We're covering Python. And this is some material that I put together myself. Um, I've been thinking long and hard about what the proper way to teach new Python programmers, new programmers in general, about object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming is a huge topic. It's way too much to cover in a single video. You know, you can study this topic for your lifetime and still learn new things about different languages. Every programming language has its own idea of what object-oriented programming is and what it should be. And it seems that, that they all disagree with each other as much as they agree. So if you take any particular language and say, this is what object-oriented programming is, and you go to another language, you'll find about half of that is true and about half of it is not true. There does not seem to be a consensus among academics that is independent of the language that they're talking about. So each language, basically the language itself defines what object-oriented programming means. And uh, so in my opinion, there's some ideas, some themes that, that seem to, to translate well to many languages, but I can't really find anything that translates well to all languages. So this is more about object-oriented programming in Python in particular. And some of these ideas you'll find do translate to other languages. Some of them do not. And if you know another language, or if you're learning another language at the same time, you'll find that some of those ideas translate well into Python, and some of them do not. So unfortunately, I, I don't think that computer science in this regard is very well established in what ob object-oriented programming means. I, I think people have a lot of strong opinions, uh, myself included, and those opinions are not necessarily supported by any fundamental logic or facts of reality or whatever, you know, not like mathematics where we can kind of come to a consensus on what certain things should be because it tends to be the simplest way or the best way to express things, right? So uh, in this video, I'm going to cover a couple of things. One thing I'm going to cover is the type system and I'm going to cover the attribute system in Python. And I've already made a video about what Python objects are. I just kind of want to reiterate some of those points. The first point is in Python, uh, variable values are all objects. There is no variable that actually stores a value that is not an object. So an integer is an object, a float is an object, uh, a string is an object. And as we learn more about different types, about the composite types, we learn that tuples and lists and dictionaries, their values can be objects. In the case of a dictionary, their keys are objects and, and, and indeed. Uh, every value, everything that you can do something with in an expression in Python is going to be an object. And I, I just like to think of it as everything in Python is an object. You can even take a Python program itself, you can compile it down and generate an abstract syntax tree, which is itself an object. So everything in Python is an object, even things that typically aren't objects in other languages, like primary basic values like integers or strings and things like functions. These are things that are objects in Python. If you were to dig into uh, Python itself and look at the C level, you would see that there is this struct called pi object. And the pi object struct has two attributes, two fields that is the same for every object in Python. And those two fields are the reference count and the type. And the type is a reference to another object, which is interesting. So, you know, uh, there's a, a fantasy story where they said that this turtles all the way down. Well, in Python, the object-oriented system, in the object-oriented system of Python, it's turtles all the way. Down. It's objects all the way down. Types are objects. Everything's an object. So uh, now, granted, there is no pure Python object that you're ever going to run into. A pure Python object in Python would just be a type and a reference count. Uh, you can try your hand at making one but those are actually user object types that you've created. Um, but at the fundamental level, everything, the things that all objects share in common are the reference count, which you don't control, and the type of the object, okay? Now, what do you do with an object? Well, in Python, you, you might think that when you're taking one plus one, you have an, uh, an integer here that you're adding to an integer there. Really what's going on is you have two objects and you're calling a function on one of those objects. And we're going to talk about the special attributes that Python provides, not only so that you can override functional like this, but so that it can be implemented, okay, in the first place. So everything really boils down to, in Python, three operations that we do on these objects. One I call attribute access. 
That is going to an object and asking it, hey, what is your X attribute? What is your Y attribute? And then Python will give back the X or Y attribute of that particular object. The next thing that you might do that I don't think we've really done much yet in our tutorial series is attribute assignment. Okay, so we've done variable assignment, we've done uh, list assignment, list value assignment, we've done uh, dictionary value assignment, we've done all kinds of assignments, but we haven't done attribute assignment yet. And the last thing, as you might expect, is attribute deletion. Not all objects you'll find in Python support attribute access for every attribute. It's going to tell you it doesn't know what that attribute is. Um, not all ob objects allow you to arbitrarily assign new attributes to the object, and not all objects allow you to delete every attribute. So there are some limits to what you can do here. Okay, So to give you a really good example of what's going on, so let's suppose that we just had a dictionary D, and we want to look up the string A in that dictionary. Okay, What's really going on in Python under the covers you know, is that Python looks up the get item attribute of the D object, and then it calls that with the parameter A. And whatever this returns will be the result of that subscription operation. Okay, So basically all of Python is syntactic sugar on top of an object system where you can access parts of an object through these attributes. Okay, um, So attribute access. We've already seen attribute access. It's pretty easy. Um, you might have a, a composite, uh, what is it, complex number, 3 minus 4j, and then you might want to say what's the real component, and that will give you 3, and then z.imag, that will give you 4, and you can even call z.conjugate, that's an ATE, and that will return 3 plus 4j, okay, as a result. And we've seen on strings, you can say like this is a string or whatever string you want, and you do dot title, and that will return a new string. Okay, so these things, the dot, and then that is the attribute access. And the, the trick is to remember that on the left side is any kind of expression, and then you have the dot, and then you have some kind of identifier. Okay, the same as a variable name, it starts with a letter. It can have letters, numbers, uh, and underscores. Okay. It can also start with an underscore too. Okay. All right. And that's how you access attributes. We've been doing that all along. Uh, I kind of, you know, looked at it and didn't really say much about it. But what about attribute assignment? As you might imagine, if you had an object that you've defined called foo, and you want to specify the bar attribute, you can just put it in an assign statement like this. And that will assign baz to the bar attribute of foo. Okay? If there is no bar attribute, it will create one if the object allows attribute creation. Okay? All right. uh, you can do these in parallel. You can do them as you know, part of a nested list. So the full assignment syntax works just like it works for dictionary and list subscription assignment. Okay? And we can delete attributes. So what we can say is delete del foo.bar. And what that does is it takes the bar attribute of foo and removes it. Okay. Now there are some functions that Python provides. One is called get adder. And what you do is you provide the object and then you provide the attribute you want. Okay. And then there is set adder the object, the attribute, and then the value that you want to set. And then there's del adder, the object and the attribute. Okay, and these, these methods, these functions, they do basically what we described above. Okay, so this is pretty useful. Okay. Now, um, one little note is you'll often hear me or other people talk about methods. Okay. Depending on the language, method means a different thing. In the Python universe, what method means is when you've accessed an attribute of the object, it returns something that you call. Okay, so this conjugate is a method, while we'll call real and a mag a, an attribute. Okay, now methods are actually attributes. Okay, so in this case also we have a title attribute, 
but title itself returns some kind of function, and so it's actually a callable attribute, and so that's a method. When we get into defining our own classes, we're gonna be a little more precise about what we mean by a method, and we're gonna see different types of method that'll arise as well. We'll see class methods and static methods and things like that, all right? Um, the other thing to think about is that attributes themselves create a sort of namespace, just like the global and the local namespace you'll see when you have function calls and stuff like that. However, you cannot really define a function that operates within that namespace, okay? In other languages, when you define a method for a class, it's assumed that that method is invoked within the namespace of the class. However, in Python, that is not so, okay? That's not really a big deal because getting to the attributes in a namespace, you just need the object and the dot to get to it, so it's pretty straightforward. But it wouldn't hurt you to think as objects having a namespace in much the same way that modules have their own namespace, okay? Except there's no program that runs inside of an object with that namespace ever present, okay? So let's talk about types now. So in Python, there is this function called type, okay? We're gonna talk a little bit more about a different way to invoke type in the next video when we cover how to create your own objects. But the one that I want you guys to think about right now is when you pass in an object to the type function, that will tell you what the type is. Okay, as an example, I can call the function type of 5.0 and that will give me back a float the actual float function that you can use to create floats, okay? And I can even, to kind of bend your mind here, ask the type function what float is. And it will tell me that this is actually the type type, okay? And let's go all the way down. What is the type of type? And the type of type is itself type. So it's turtles all the way down. It's types all the way down, objects all the way down to the bottom of Python. This is something to play around with. now. As I've introduced new types in Python, I've given you functions that you can use to create those types. Functions named like int, float, complex, bool, str, bytes, byte array, tuple, list, dict, set, frozen set, these things, okay? So these functions are themselves not really functions. They behave like functions, but they're actually types. So from now on, I'm not gonna be calling them functions, I'm gonna be calling them types. So that's gonna be a little Confusing for, if you go back and watch the previous videos, I'll call them functions, but now I'm gonna be calling them types. So I'll say the int type. And what I mean by the int type is actually int, okay? And you can create a new int by passing in like a string like this. And that will create a new int from the string five, right? And this is the int type. I might call it an int function, but generally the functions are types in Python, or types are functions in Python. Last little thing I wanna talk about is is instance. There's two ways to call is instance. You can call it with an object and then a type, and this will return true or false. If the object is of the type or of a type derived or from this type or inheriting that type, we're gonna talk about inheritance in a completely separate video, then this will return true. Otherwise it will turn false. So for instance, I might say is instance uh, 5.0, is that a string? And the answer for that will be false. But if I said is instance uh, a, a string, that will give me true, okay? You can also call is instance with a tuple of types as a second parameter. So if I call it like this, or a float, so this is saying, is 5.0 a string or a bool or a float? And the answer is yes, it's a float. So this is true. Okay, so that's the other way to call it is instance. Now, having shown you that you can get the type of an object and that you can test the type of an object using is instance, I'm going to recommend that you don't do this, okay? There's only very specific cases where this is even necessary. And otherwise, if you're adding calls to is instance or to checking the value of the return of type, you're probably doing something that is naughty. And the reason why it's naughty is because in Python, you can create new types that emulate and behave exactly like existing types that are not the same type, okay? A good example of this is like a complex, right? So 
complex numbers behave an awful lot like floats with additional things, okay? If you were to write your function such that you always tested to see if the number was a float, and then somebody were to come along and say, gee, I really wish these functions worked with complex numbers, then they would have to basically rewrite all of your code, removing those checks for float. If on the other hand, you wrote your code so that it wasn't checking to see if these are floats, it just pretended they were floats and just tried to run the function anyway, then somebody can come along and they could throw complex numbers into your system and it'll just behave the right way. Okay, and there might be some future types as well, quaternions, octonions, things like this that they might want to introduce in the system that you didn't anticipate. Okay, so don't check for types unless you really need to. And the two cases where I've seen in my career where I check for types. One is when I am serializing data. And what that means is I'm taking some object, I'm converting it to a sequence of bytes with the intention that on the other end, they can read that sequence of bytes and recreate exactly that object. And so when I'm serializing, I need to know the type and I need to have different paths of behaviors for different kinds of types. I'm not gonna serialize a dictionary with the same code that I serialize a float or a string, right? They're gonna be completely separate code paths. And so I need to say, if this is a float, do this. If this is a string, do that, okay? And then in this case, I'm gonna have some kind of fallback where I can fall back to if you want to introduce a new type that I haven't previously anticipated, you can write your own serialization code and deserialization code, blah, blah, blah. Okay, the second case is sometimes we want different behavior. Okay, and a case like this is you're not gonna walk a list the same way you walk a dictionary, okay? So if you hand me a dictionary and say, can you please walk through all the values? Well, if I treat the dictionary as a list, I'm just gonna walk through the keys, not the values. So I need to treat the dictionary differently than I treat the list, okay? And so in this case, I, I might write code that says, if it's a list, do this. If it's a dictionary, do that, okay? But even in this case, it's probably better for the user that's calling my function to create the right representation of their object. So they should take their dictionary, probably convert it to a list of values, and then pass it into my thing to do the thing. Right, so that's, that's kind of the only cases where I've really done that. Now, the thing that you, I want you to keep in mind is called duct typing. And I'll bring it up again when we talk about inheritance and some other things. Duct typing says that if something behaves like a duck, if it walks like a duck, if it talks like a duck, if it smells like a duck, if it swims like a duck, then for all intents and purposes, for your program, it's a duck, right? It could be a goose. It could be a different species of duck you've never seen before but it's kind of pointless to ask and say, are you a duck, right? Just use the code, use the object and see what happens. If something bad goes on, you can raise an exception saying that, hey, you passed the wrong type in. But generally, uh, if, if the object works, it works. And there's no reason checking for the type or making sure that it's a particular entrance. Uh, particular instance. Anyway guys, thanks for watching this. I hope this was useful. If you have questions, please meet me on Discord or you can ask in the comments below. I hope you guys have a great day and Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching this video on the theory of Python by Real Physics. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell, like, and share this video. You can find me on Discord or support me on Patreon. Links are in the description below. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.